Okay, we're gonna start now with the webinar. Uh, welcome everybody to our WSU OSU Treefruit Extension webinar series. On behalf, uh, I'm Benardita Felato, Treefruit Extension Specialist uh, at WSU, and on behalf of my co-host Ashley Thompson, Extension Specialist at Oregon State University, and Matthew Whiting also from Washington State University. We would like to, I'm very pleased to welcome you to our sixth session about sweet cherry hardiness and cold damage assessment. Here is a little uh, agenda of what we're gonna cover in this webinar. We're gonna start with an overview of cold damage in tree fruit with uh, Matthew Whiting. Then we're gonna have two research updates one on cold hardiness variation among cultivars by Jonathan Magby, and then new tools for reducing cold damage by Brent Arnold. Then Matthew Whiting will give a live tutorial on assessing cold damage, and we're gonna finalize with a final Q&A session. We'll get going. Yeah, good morning. Uh, for those of you who are on the west coast of the United States and good afternoon to those of you in the east and good evening perhaps to those of you from connecting from around the world. Um, I'm delighted to be participating here in our sixth of the webinar, Tree Fruit webinar series in a collaboration with Washington State University and Oregon State University. Thank you for the introduction, Bernadita. So this is really sort of a timely webinar that was, was been put together in large part uh, due to popular demand and interest very locally. We've had a, a very, we've come through a very cold weekend here in Washington state and there was much concern over the condition and quality of, of, of tree fruit. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, we've also got a couple of graduate students who have been investigating key issues related to cold hardiness, and so it's a great opportunity for them to give you a brief update on their research as well. And then, as Bernadita said, I'll finish up by doing some, uh, hopefully this will work well, some live demonstrations, cutting into some spurs that we've collected and having a look at how to assess uh, potential cold damage on your own farms. So I'm going to begin with an overview, which is really uh, to, set to be a primer and a review for most, most of you and more intention to set the stage for both John and, and Brent's research presentations that are subsequently. So I'll talk very briefly about why we are concerned about cold damage um, and touch on briefly how actually these cold temperatures do damage tissues. And then looking at this issue of cold hardiness and um, how is it gained, how is it acquired, how is it lost? And also a little bit about how we actually assess cold hardiness. Uh, in research terms, uh, how you might be able to do it yourselves, and some of the some of the tools that we use to, to do that. So but again, why we're interested in cold hardiness? Well, quite simply, it's because cold damage causes the greatest crop loss, crop failures, economic losses worldwide. This is some data from FAO, and this is absolutely true for the United States as well. Um, I could share with you at the beginning here any number of headlines that have come out in, the, in, the, in this past year of 2020. As difficult as it's been for other reasons, it's also been a very challenging year again for, for cold damage. In the spring, we had uh, cold weather events in the, in the northeastern regions, New York, Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, apple production. Um, and as well, we had a significant frost event in the, uh, in the north, northwest as well. So annually, uh, cold damage is a significant significant concern. Now the extent of damage will vary year to year, though it is a perennial problem. The, the larger image of the cherry orchard on the left is one that I took in Spain a couple of years ago. It's a bit difficult to tell from this distance, but that uh, orchard that's trained to the Spanish bush, it's got covers above it. Um, it's about a six leaf block ready to go into full production and they were hammered by snow, cold temperatures and frost, which damaged most of that crop. And if you cut through those flowers, as we're gonna do a little bit later today, you can see on the, on the top right, the healthy looking flowers, and you can see the discolored tissues in those, in those uh, dead flowers. In 2007 was one of the more significant events of cold damage in the United States, where the Eastern United States fruit and vegetable industries had estimated losses of over $2 billion. In 2012, the Michigan apple crop was nearly eliminated with losses estimated at a little bit over $200 million. And that was due to uh, early, early spring frosts. And in 2020, in this past year, there were also significant damages throughout much of European fruit and vegetable production. In some cases, people reporting complete crop losses 
um, and other cases, uh, significant reductions in yield. So this is a perennial problem. This is a global problem. So the issue is that plants or plant parts more specifically will freeze when they cannot avoid ice nucleation and they cannot prevent the growth of ice. So there's actually a lot to this. Um, ice nucleation is, is a fascinating process that is influenced by intrinsic and extrinsic features within the trees. Um, and that is the event when the ice crystallizes and begins to propagate and, and grow through plant parts and plant organs that freeze damage occurs. And we'll get into that just scratching the surface, don't have time to go into a lot of the details of that. But if you take a look at a typical plant cell, there are two ways in which ice will form. The first of which is extracellular or outside of the cells, or it's essentially in between the cell layers and the apoplast. This creates, as ice forms there, it creates a difference in water potential though. So this is a non-lethal formation of ice and it does not kill the cells. But what it can do over time, as temperatures progressively decline, more and more water uh, exits the cell and is transferred into the apoplast and, and it does uh, freeze, can continue to freeze. And this over time will dehydrate the cell and lead to cell death. So ice forming in the apoplast withdraws water from the inside of the cell, dehydrating the cell and causing cell death. The second one that happens when temperatures continue to drop is intracellular ice formation. And that is essentially immediately lethal to plant cells. Uh, there's a loss of membrane function and electrolytes and cell contents can no longer be contained and there is cell death. There's an interesting paper uh, about uh, 20 years ago that was published, look, you looking at low temperature scanning electron microscopy. This happens to be tobacco leaves. I just wanted to point out some of the features. On the left is a control or a non-frozen tobacco leaf. This is a transverse section through the leaf where you can identify the palisade mesophyll cells and the spongy mesophyll cells. And there's good turgor. You can get that idea from the, from the shape and from the, the, uh, the structure of these cells. I want to contrast that on the right where they froze these tissues at about at a rate of about four degrees Celsius per hour and retrieve those images at minus 20. And now you can clearly see total cellular collapse in both the palisade and the spongy mesophyll layers. And this is indicative of what I mentioned in the previous slide. This is a process of freezing induced cellular dehydration. So that extracellular water that was forming withdrew uh, water from the cells and led to their death through dehydration. And this is a process that occurs in, in apple and cherry and pear buds and tissues as well. So when does this uh, dehydration, when does this freeze damage occur? Well, we can classify the processes into three distinct periods. The one that we're in the northern hemisphere experiencing right now is this late fall, this early winter period. And the damage can happen before the plants have acclimated. I'll get into that acclimation process a little bit in the next couple slides. The next period that we can experience winter cold damage is in the middle of winter when trees and buds have, have acquired their, their maximum hardiness levels. But at some moments, uh, low temperatures can exceed their tolerance and we can experience winter damage. And lastly, and sometimes the most problematic is late winter or early spring. And this is following a deacclimation or beginning of new growth, bud swell, increased water content, and increased sensitivity of buds to cold damage. So we are currently right now in Washington state in this late fall, early winter stage. And there are several concerns uh, for sweet cherry growers and it would relate to floral buds and even vegetative tissue that may not have acclimated properly to the severe cold temperatures. I'm showing you an image here also, it's not from this, this year, but from a few years ago where the apple growers um, had a significant percentage of their crop remaining on the tree, weren't able to harvest it before the cold snap arrived. And this, is, this has occurred this past season as well. And so growers will go to extraordinary measures to try to save a crop, in this case, running under tree irrigation water, which isn't particularly effective actually, but it does make for a, for a spectacular photo. Um, and when apples are on the tree and they have an internal core temperature of about 14 uh, Fahrenheit, or I believe that's somewhere around minus nine Celsius, then those fruit are, are clearly lost. <clears throat> 
We had an issue actually very recently after uh, I was hired. Um, this was in 2002, where we had what was uh, what has become known as the Halloween freeze. And I'm showing you here just air temperature, daily air temperature data over uh, over the month, late September into October and then into November. And you can see how it was declining um, and yet remaining fairly warm until the 31st Halloween evening. Um, in This is in Prosser area when there was a significant decline to um, about 14, 15 degrees Fahrenheit. And we spent a lot of time after that freeze, cutting through spurs, cutting through buds, trying to evaluate and determine the, the, uh, the potential of the loss. And we'll get into this a little bit later. So those late fall, those early winter uh, cold events prior to acclimation can be, can be significantly damaging. In midwinter, it's typically the period with the least damage. And um, we found that though the temperatures are the most extreme, that typically by the time you get into the middle of the, of the winter season, there has been sufficient acclimation and, and plants have, have achieved uh, full end of dormancy and are uh, very resilient and resistant to cold temperatures. The exceptions come when you have warm weather spells and, and that can be sometimes a day or two or, or a longer period of a week of, of elevated temperatures. And the issue here is that trees and buds will lose their hardiness level much faster than they regain it. So they can become quickly sensitive to, to uh, when temperatures warm up in the winter and then return to, to normal or colder temperatures. And then there's a spring period. And this is generally the period where we experience the greatest damage and gets the greatest headlines with frost damage, uh, wiping out crops. Uh, this happens every year uh, somewhere in Washington state. Uh, growers lose a percentage of their crop. And it's generally due to the increased water content and therefore there's more uh, water available to freeze in these tissues and that leads to increased sensitivity to cold damage. And this is not a new idea, this has been evaluated for decades and decades. In fact, in my position, my, my predecessor's predecessor, uh, Dr. Ed Probsting and some of his team, including uh, Dr. Andrews, and, uh, and Dr. Willett were involved with the early days of trying to develop hardiness and critical temperature charts to relate stages of cherry bud development to their sensitivity to cold damage. Now we've since revisited these uh, stages and their sensitivities um, and examining many, many different genotypes and, uh, and John Magby is gonna describe some of his work in that area a little bit later. So the processes of acclimation and deacclimation are critically important to hardiness and levels of hardiness. You can think of it simply as in the middle of summer, of course, if we got down to zero degrees, much of the tree would be killed immediately. But there are periods where these trees can withstand negative 20 or negative 30 degrees in midwinter. So that's due to their acclimation or deacclimation. And this hardiness cycle begins with cold acclimation in the fall. This generally coincides with the termination of growth or the cessation of, of growth. And it's, it's accomplished or the signals are received by leaves in large part. And that's twofold. It's a, it's a reduction in day length and it's a reduction in temperature. And those signals are perceived and lead to metabolic changes which increase the hardiness and the, uh, the processes of acclimation to cold temperatures. Then subsequently deep winter hardiness or full hardiness is accomplished. And this is something that's very quantitative. We'll show you some data a little bit later. You can put very good numbers to this. And it's also reversible, as I've just been mentioning in the previous slides, that you go through these, these cycles of dehardening and rehardening. And this has been assessed for many different crops throughout the middle of the winter. And then these trees go through a process of deacclimation and increased sensitivity to cold temperatures in the spring. This process of deacclimation is almost exclusively driven by ambient air and tissue temperatures in the spring. And here's one example. There are many uh, I could share, but this is one from a, some work that we published um, six or seven years ago, looking at a seasonal trend in hardiness. So it, you can see it runs from the period of October where we are now in the Northern Hemisphere through till April, this is bud break. This is for the cultivar sweetheart. And so in the fall, you have the declining air temperatures which are plotted in the top half of the figure. In the bottom half of the figure, we're showing you the LT10, the LT50 and the LT90. So that is the lethal temperature that was sufficient to kill approximately 10% of the floral buds 50% or 90% of those floral buds. And so you can see that those temperatures required to kill 10 or 50 or 90 decline as those natural uh, air temperatures decline. 
And you can also see that hardening and dehardening process though. There's a warm spell here in the fall and you can see as, as a result, the hardiness that had been accomplished was lost partially and uh, buds were killed at warmer temperatures in response to that. Then you get into the maximum hardiness level. This is generally throughout the midwinter. It tends to be fairly stable. You tend to have less variation between the, the temperature to kill 10 and the temperature to kill 90% or full, fully kill all the uh, floral buds. Um, and then you get in the process of deacclimation. Again, this is driven by warming temperatures in the spring. And you can see that quite quickly that hardiness is lost and tissues become sensitive to, to cold temperatures. So how do we assess hardiness? I want to just touch on this very briefly. There's quite a bit that one could go into here on the different techniques. I want to begin with the simplest one. Uh, this is just visual observations. The picture on the right is a, is a Granny Smith tree that we were digging through uh, years ago in response to these late fall freezes. And what we're looking at here is the cambial tissue, trying to assess the kind of tissue death to the, uh, to the phloem and to the cambium tissue. And you can do that by cutting through the through the bark, through the cortex layers and, and assessing just visually the, the, the coloration. Typically that's done several days after the, uh, the concern uh, temperature. You can also sample buds and cut through those. And actually that's what we'll get into a little bit later in, this, in the webinar. Another technique is to take tissues and look for the conductivity of these tissues or the conductivity of extracts. And that's due to the fact that that internal cellular freezing which kills the, the tissues will leads to loss of membrane function and, and leakage of electrolytes. And so you can higher electrolyte leakage is an indication of increased damage to those tissues. And then the one that we've spent the most effort on, the most time with, probably because it is um, in, in many ways more empirical, uh, is using controlled freezing processes in programmable freeze chambers. And there are other various ways to use these chambers. Um, I'm going to show you very briefly differential thermal analyses. Um, there's a more recent techniques when when exotherm analysis is not possible in the, in the fall or in the spring and uh, different processes have been developed, including those that are called polar pods or a vending machine that's been utilized. Um, you can also use differential scanning calorimetry to, uh, to assess exotherm analyses. So very briefly, I'll describe differential thermal analyses because um, both of the subsequent presenters will describe some of their work in collecting DTA analysis. In essence, what we do is we take buds or, or spurs and we place them on thermal electric modules in a freezer. And that's an illustration here in the bottom right. You can see inside these, these aluminum tins, a couple of thermal electric modules. Now these are sensitive and can detect the latent heat of fusion. So as water freezes, the, it's an exothermic reaction and that is detected by these thermal electric uh, modules. And that's converted into an electric electric signal that is then measured by a data logger. And so what you get is a, is a response, something similar to what you see here on the left. These are some data that we published in 2012 and 2013. Um, and it reveals this large peak here on the right. These are the warmer temperatures here. We're going from about negative five Celsius all the way to negative 35 Celsius. And you can see a massive amount of water and a large peak here. That's indicative, right, of that non-lethal extracellular freezing we call this the high temperature exotherm. And now as we get, as the temperatures decline, you begin to pick up these very precise peaks, which are those low temperature exotherms, which are indicative of a freezing of a floral, floral meristem. Now you can use these data when you collect uh, numbers of, of buds and, high, and numbers of replications to using various uh, logarithmic formulas to determine lethal temperatures that are required to kill for example, 10%, 50% of the buds are 90. And that's reflected here in these figures. This is for Bing and Chelan and Sweetheart on three different days in the middle of the winter, uh, collected from our Rosa farm here in Prosser. And what you're seeing here is each exotherm plotted versus temperature. So again, we're going from about minus five, in this case to minus 25 degrees Celsius. And you can see that some buds freeze at minus seven or minus eight, and some buds in that same cultivar, same sampling date, are hardy to minus 15, minus 20. So what you see here is significant variability. You see variability over time, over sampling date. So for example, on February the 2nd, the buds had much greater hardiness than they did here on February 29th, right? You can also see differences among the cultivars. So those curves are a slightly different shape. 
Uh, and there's also differences in hardiness on individual dates among cultivars. And uh, John's going to describe his work in this uh, subsequently. But also within cultivar, and this is something that's particularly intriguing to me, why is it, for example, that some buds on the March 29th in Bing were frozen, were killed at a temperature of about minus 10 degrees, and yet others were hardy to at least minus 20. So there's a lot of variability. But from these kinds of relationships, we can generate the LT10, which is the data that we typically share with industry. And that is the temperature that is lethal to about 10% of the floral buds. And here's the results from, from John's data that were collected just last week on the 22nd of October. So just prior to the cold weather that we experienced here. And you can see that Bing, in terms of degrees Fahrenheit, was hardy to about 12.6, and Rainier and Regina were slightly less hardy. So then the question becomes, knowing that, if we know what temperatures are killing these buds from these analysis methods, what can you do about it? Uh, in some cases, there's not a lot, but there are different techniques that are being deployed, one of which are heaters. These can be propane or, or there used to be uh, diesel return stack heaters that were used. These have largely been, uh, been banned um, from, from uh, issues related to pollution. Uh, not particularly a sustainable technique and not necessarily effective, right? We, we sometimes describe these as heating the sky because much of that energy is, being, uh, is going directly vertical and, uh, and less is radiated into the canopies. Sometimes they're used in combination with wind machines, sometimes around the perimeter of an orchard or sometimes beneath a wind machine. Wind machines have become the most popular and most widely adopted technique for reducing cold damage. They are mildly effective when there is a radiative freeze. And that is the one in which there's a, an inversion with a cold layer nearest to the ground and a warmer air mass above that. And the wind machines simply function to displace and exchange that air, displace the colder air mass and replace it with the warmer air mass from above. So they can be effective for a few degrees in, um, in these radiative frosts. Of course, they're, they are ineffective when we're considering um, advective frosts or large cold air masses that are moving through with, uh, with some degree of wind speed. And similar to that photo I showed you before, irrigation is a technique that's sometimes used. I would suggest more in, more in desperation. Um, uh, this block was, uh, was run through the night with under tree micro sprinklers. And, it, and again, it creates rather a spectacular photo and interesting environment there, but there's not a lot of um, warmth or heat were being released um, in, in this, uh, using this technique. Some other places of the world will use over tree micro sprinklers to try to take advantage of the, the heat of fusion, that exothermic reaction of freezing water to maintain uh, bud temperatures above, above lethal temperatures. And later this morning, Brent's going to describe some of his work that we've been looking at developing a sustainable alternative to these different techniques. So let me finish by describing um, what one might predict as, as uh, for cold damage into the future. I've explained that it, it, cold damage causes the greatest uh, economic crop losses worldwide. And I'm afraid I think it, it's going to get worse. Um, we've seen warmer summers. In fact, uh, this past September, uh, was the warmest September in recorded history. And so that means that trees are not able to acclimate enough time. They need those cool late summers uh, and early falls in order to gain that hardiness prior to the uh, cold temperatures. We've also seen warmer winters and more erratic weather. So those warm spikes in the middle of the winter, those, those cold spikes in, the, in, the, in later in spring are, are becoming more problematic. And so as we think about growing cherries and other fruit crops, we need resilience. And I think what, what the researchers are going to share with you next is some of the ways that our programs have been trying to develop resilience to these issues and developing some practical tools for growers as well. Pleasure. Thanks, everybody.